In our last video, we looked into and discovered what Tomie is, or at least what she's based on. Now knowing what she is is fine and all, but when it comes to Tomie, the mystery goes far beyond what kind of monster she is, and this leaves you wondering more so, how does one chapter correlate to another? In one chapter, you see her live the mundane life of a student, in others, you see her make several attempts at preserving her own image. Are these differing chapters connected in some way, or are they as episodic as they appear to be? Also, what about Tomie herself? What are her aspirations? What is her character development? Is there a hidden, overlaying plot playing out in the background of these various chapters? Well, that is what we're going to be looking into today. Before we begin, let's organize and break down the slew of questions that were just presented. So the first couple questions I mentioned was essentially, how does the chapters of her acting different within vastly differentiating settings correlate to each other? Are they episodic in nature, or is there an actual consistent story going on? A simplified way of looking at this is, does Tomie, as a story and as a character, have a sense of plot progression and character development? Simply put, the answer would be yes. But to be fair, this isn't a simple question to answer. To start things off, we're going to be looking at chapter 1, and from there, progress forward to chapters 2 through 4, so on and so forth, to explain this progression of character growth. Let's begin. In Chapter 1, Tomie seems to be completely unaware of her situation, and when I say situation, I mean the fact she has died. Tomie's lack of self-awareness to her circumstance is seen a few times throughout the chapter, like pages 12 and 28. When reading through this chapter, they paint Tomie as though she is someone with no mysterious past or odd qualities to her. If you were to look at page 16, you would also see one of her friends is quoted saying, We've been pals since we were little showing she's even had a childhood with these people. It's as though she's never experienced anything like the supernatural before. Outside of being feared by her immediate classmates for very obvious and very logical reasons, there's not much noted of her when it comes to her recent return from the dead. None of the male students become enthralled or obsessed with her, and no one feels compelled to kill her out of obsession. In fact, quite the opposite happens. The only reason why she was killed in this chapter was because her teacher took advantage of an opportunity to get rid of her when finding out she was with child, his child. This is compounded with the fact she had used her taboo relationship with him as blackmail to pressure him into possibly divorcing his wife. You see, whether or not her fall was fatal didn't matter, for the dilemma with him was that if it was discovered that he had been in a sexual relationship with Tomie, one of his students, most assuredly, his career as well as his reputation would have gone down the drain. Notice that up until her death, no supernatural phenomenon and no inhuman traits are found when it comes to Tomie. This chapter establishes Tomie as the human she once was, and will act as a source of comparison for the final chapters. With Tomie's origin story in place, we now have ourselves a starting point of progression for our character. When reading chapters 2 through 4, we find an interesting story about Tomie, Mr. Takagi, and Tsukiko, the photographer girl, which helps lay the groundwork for most of them as recurring characters. If chapter 1 was Tomie before becoming a monster, then chapters 2 through 4 is her dealing with the result and trying to reverse it. This is where Tomie's character traits and complexities will first come to light. One of the many things we must take heed when reading these chapters is how Tomie's psyche works. When we read the various chapters, we notice a common trait amongst them. Tomie always starts out a chapter seemingly normal, but the moment things don't go her way, or when she is injured in some way, she changes her personality and becomes either hyperbolically mean-spirited or vindictive to those around her. If said bad situation is pushed for her, like say she was killed or dismembered, her personality and actions warp even further. The key to why this is lies in two things. The photographs in chapter two, and Tomie's maliciousness towards her own clones. There's a reason why so many times, including chapter two, Tomie's requested her 
tumor be removed and then burned? The reason is because of her two personalities. That's right, she has two personas. One is of her true self, what she is biologically, what she is at a primal level, a monster. And the other is her mentally, her human personality, which is simply a false shadow of her past, always seeking to reestablish itself in her. The human aspects of Tomie is usually in the driver's seat of her psyche and only switches spots with her and her demon when the going gets tough. To further define the relationship between Tomie's human and monster personalities, I would like to bring up some specifics for what could shift the psychological balance. Typically, it seems that if Tomie has an absent head slash brain, or is consistently in a state of injury, like regenerating from a piece of flesh in Chapter 6, or being stuck in hyperthermic weather like in Chapter 5, she's more so than not in a monster personality state of mind. One could say the monster personality is more instinctually driven than anything, acting as an emergency backup source of consciousness. Essentially, the rule of thumb is, if her head or brain is somewhat recoverable and she's not in a state of injury, she retains more of her human personality than her monster personality and is mostly in control. At this point in the story, chapters 2 through 4, Tomie's human side is now aware of her inner monster and wishes to subdue the side of her by any means necessary. This is why she and Mr. Takagi run these experiments on people so that Tomie may find a cure and can return to the life she once knew. Since Tomie's monster personality seems to come out when Tomie is in physical harm or mental stress, looking back at chapter 4 with Tomie changing her mind about the experiments after playing with the fishbowl makes sense, because when you think about it, directly before that scene, she was regenerating from her head being lopped off, and as we know, that temporarily brings out her monster personality, which cares not for her wishes of returning to normal. In addition, what was probably keeping her monster personality in play was the fact that while in this state, Tomie would keep playing with the acid in the fishbowl, which would keep her in a constant state of regeneration, and thus her monster personality in control. This is why she appears to have an almost fickle approach to the situation at the time, and this whole concept explains why she acts so differently between being fully generated and partially regenerating. This idea of two conflicting personalities also explains why in so many chapters, including this one, characters seem to emphasize how Tomie's true self is revealed when her pictures are taken. It's a common theme carried throughout the series. Now that Tomie's true inner personality and false outward shell personality has been explained, we can now move on to Tomie's third stage in character development. Tomie is not very often honest, nor transparent throughout the series. You see her many, many times, like in chapters 2, 7, 12, and so on, go about lying through her teeth. But 10 is special. Quite special. Chapter 10 is one of the few chapters where Tomie actually lets her guard down and doesn't cloud her answers with generalities or made-up stories. The beauty of this chapter is that while Tomie may have acted at her worst, this was also where another Tomie acted at her sweetest, and the interesting parallel here is that the sweet one spouts nothing but sugar-coated lies, while the nasty one is transparent and straight to the point, although with a harsh tone. This obvious yet beautifully mirrored setup is why chapter 10 is honestly my favorite chapter. It gives us such a wide range of aspect when it comes to Tomie and treats us with this moment of clarity. Tomie is the definition of vagueness, so to have such transparency is a nice change in pace. Even when compared to the mansion arc and the hospital arc, this chapter gives away the largest chunk of plot revelations out of all the chapters. One neat reveal this chapter brings is the idea of all Tomie sharing thoughts with each other, as can be seen at the conclusion of this chapter. This little tidbit of information right here shows that all Tomie seem to not necessarily share a single mind, but rather all share and have access to a live sequence of memories and thoughts. A memory bank, if you will. With that, let's move on and examine some neat quotes in this story. On page 157, we find the main male character of this chapter, Tetsuo, asking Tomie, why are you and Tomie trying to kill each other? And Tomie, in her own layman's terms, gives him a straight answer. I don't know why that is, but I can say there's only room for one Tomie. I'm the real Tomie. The other Tomies are fakes. The one that wants to take my life, and the completely different Tomie that ordered that Tomie killed. This quote right here, as well as her admission of genuinely not knowing what she is on page 140, reveals two things. One, 
All Tomies think they themselves are the real Tomies and are in competition with each other. We've seen subtle innuendos to this in past chapters, but this confirms what we could only guess up till now. This, in turn, reveals all Tomies are not of hive mindset, but rather are of individual thought and purpose. They all may be cut from the same cloth, but they each retain individuality. This need to retain their individuality is what motivates them to eliminate each other, as to ensure this personal sense of reality. Adding on to this, it doesn't help that the sight of other Tomies breaks this illusion Tomie is trying to convey for herself where she is not a monster. Seeing other Tomies ruins this false reality of hers. As I said before, Tomie's personality is a false shadow of her past seeking to reestablish itself. How can it do that if her false perception of reality keeps getting broken? Let's talk about the second revelation we found on page 140. Here is where Tomie has a simple, quick exchange with Tetsuo, where she answers his questions of her bizarre generation and growth by simply stating, I don't know why. Normally, Tomie would have responded with some clever remark or a sarcastic insult instead of directly answering the question, like in chapter 19. But this time, this time, she didn't. It may not have been much of an answer, but it's an answer nonetheless and is more than what could be said for any other point in the series. You even see her immediately close back up emotionally after saying that by trying to change the subject and waving off what she had just said. It's almost as though this is a difficult subject for her and she doesn't wish to dwell on it for very long. The simple exchange reveals that Tomie seems to not fully understand what is happening to her, but at the same time she has moved on from trying to understand. At this point, she isn't trying to reverse her ailments anymore, and rather is trying to cope with her situation. As the volumes progress, she realizes her mortality and has begun to accept her reality to some degree. This might be why she goes from seeking a cure in Chapter 4, to making do trying to find a medium for which to capture her human likeness in Chapter 9. She's pretty much settling for something easier to strive for in terms of feeding her delusion. At this point in the story, she is limiting her ambitions and is trying to substitute her drive for a normal life with superficial things that a girl would tend to enjoy. To describe her situation, this is a girl who replicates herself upon death, and when the new girl arises, she retains all the memories of the previous Tomie, if not shares a memory bank with all Tomies. When so many of these cycles pass and this new current Tomie is born, she is probably under the defeatist mindset of a prisoner's last meal, whereas her fate is sealed anyway, so she might as well make the most of it. With this idea in mind, she aims to capture every aspect of a girl's fantasy before she dies. Ergo, caviar, jewelry, dresses, etc. Every time a new Tomie is born into this world, it's use her abilities to manipulate men, enjoy fine living, get killed by said men, her individual existence ends, rinse, and repeat. She is in a metaphorical prison for which she cannot escape. This is a prison made not of iron, but of flesh. As we progress further into the series, we notice a gradual simplification and worsening of Tomie's personality. Even though Tomie is still seeking material pleasures out of the world, it isn't with the same peppering of personality and characteristics she had before. Notice, after all the arcs prior to Chapter 10 had passed, Tomie's attitude becomes progressively more predictable and streamlined. Virtually all ambition has vacated her. Tomie stops developing as a character and starts regressing as a character. It's obvious her mind has begun to deteriorate from chapter 10 onward because of this pattern we now see with her yearning for caviar, jewelry, dresses, over and over again, want, want, want. The fact her inner monster is slowly corroding her outward personality and identity might explain the reasoning for her increasing extremism. It's at this point that we reach the end of the echo chamber that was Tomie's identity. If you were to compare the Tomie of Chapter 1 to the Tomie of now, you'd notice a vast difference in how she interacts with the world around her, albeit for a short time. In Chapter 1, she seems at worst misguided, but only within the confines of an ordinary girl. She's just a girl who's trying to pursue a relationship with an older man, because in her eyes, he symbolizes adulthood and maturity. We all know this type of girl. Teenagers who think like this are pretty common. She doesn't have some grand ulterior motive, nor does she have control of any and all situations. 
She is as much a victim to the whims of daily life as any other person. In essence, she's much more tamer and normalized compared to her other chapter counterparts. Now look at her. Her identity has eroded and her humanity is now non-existent. Tomie the human being has been defeated, and what is left is but a shadow of a shadow. Faded echoes of her human identity long gone. Her individuality has been reduced from a complex series of ambitions and aspirations to a handful of raw emotions like narcissism, pride, and envy, coupled with a shallow set of desires and impulses. She has become someone who still seeks and craves these desires without knowing why anymore. She no longer thinks. She now acts. She is now a husk who has lost purpose and meaning. In a way, her own existence is a strain on her psyche, just as it is upon the minds of men she's encountered. In a way, her area of affectability to deteriorate the psyche of those around her not only affects them, but affects her as well just in a much, much longer process of death and rebirth instead. A cycle for which beats down upon her soul, time and time again, until her soul and sense of self has been reduced to nothing. This is the apex of Tomie's character. This is the fate of Tomie.